Welcome everyone uh, to our online panel, um, an update on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My name is Marcus Thiel. I'm a professor for European Union politics in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University. And I also direct our EU Jean Monnet Center of Excellence here, um, together with my colleague, Christine Kali. Um, I'll be moderating this panel today with my esteemed colleague, Tatiana, Professor Tatiana Kostadinova, who is um, also an expert on Russian and uh, Eastern European politics in the department. And we're glad that you're here, um, especially, of course, with, you know, following the news about the renewed conflict in the Middle East. So we're really grateful that you also pay attention to this important uh, conflict. Unfortunately, one of our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Sam Green, he can't be here today, but we have, of course, still a wonderful um, expert, uh, Ms. Elina Beketova from Ukraine. And um, I look forward to hearing from you. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a couple of good questions for you later. Um, as you may know, this lengthy war has tested the astonishing resilience of Ukrainians, but also anchored Ukraine further in the West. And we can talk about all of this later on. While at the same time, however, cracks in international support um, among Europeans as well as the United States are slowly appearing. Um, and I think that the new conflict just contributes to that weakening of support. So um, the overall question then what the future holds um, becomes more pressing, right? It, will it be you know, Russia's loss and Putin's removal and whatever else happens afterwards? Will it be a frozen conflict, a stalemate that goes on, you know, for years, maybe decades, as we've seen in the region? Will there be hopes for a negotiated diplomatic settlement when both parties are, um, you know, exhausted enough to get to the table and certain conditions are being met? So in the following one, one, and a half, one hour, 50 minutes, we'll be hearing from our esteemed expert from the Center of European Policy Analysis in Washington, D.C., um, Ms. Elina Begetova. Um, and about the ongoing conflict, um, the progress, if we can call it that, and the chances for possibly a peaceful resolution and any complicating factors. You'll also have a chance to ask questions um, at the end. So, but before I hand it over to my colleague, Professor Kostadinova, who will introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to thank, first and foremost, um, Christine Kali, um, our right hand, and without her, you know, um, that would have not been possible. Of course, also, I want to thank um, the School of International Public Affairs, Ruth K. and Shepard Broad uh, Distinguished Lecture Series, as well as the Vatschak Havel Program for Human Rights and Democracy, and of course, the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, D.C., um, who is uh, Ms. Begetova is a fellow resident there. So now I hand it over to my colleague, Professor Kostadinova. The floor is all yours. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, since February of uh, 2022, as my colleague, uh, Professor Till, uh, started uh, talking about, Ukraine has suffered losses of territory, infrastructure, and most importantly, human lives in a bloody war against uh, the Russian invasion. Millions of Ukrainians, women, children, and elderly have left their country. A year and a half later, in our uh, days at present, the war is still continuing with no clear prospects uh, for peace to be achieved uh, soon. Uh, this situation has an impact on both countries, on Ukraine and, uh, uh, and Russia. As men are called for, the, for military duty and they're being sent to, to the front line, significant resources are directed to cover ex the expenses of the war. And losses are growing exponentially, although at a much, much higher rate for Ukraine, the country which is under attack. So to better understand the most recent developments with the war, but also with its uh, implications for domestic poli uh, politics uh, in Ukraine and Russia, we have invited uh, uh, an excellent uh, um, colleague and uh, expert uh, who understands very well the region of the former Soviet Union and especially Ukrainian uh, politics. Uh, I have the honor to introduce to you now Ms. Elina Beketova, 
She's an in-residence fellow with the Democracy Fellowship Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Her research focuses on the temporarily occupied uh, territories of Ukraine after Russia's full-scale invasion on February 24, 2022. Uh, Elena Beketova started her career as a journalist uh, in Fedosia, Crimea, working for the local newspaper. Later, she participated in Benjamin Franklin Transatlantic Fellowship in Wake Forest University and Global Undergraduate Exchange Program at the University of Mississippi. Elena Beketova worked as a journalist, editor, and TV anchor for different news stations in Kharkiv and Kiev in Ukraine. As a part of International Insight, the TV program Elena hosted uh, she conducted interviews with a number of guests, including such prominent names as uh, Kurt Volker, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, Anders Rasmussen, Wesley Clark, Lech Walesa, Alexander Kwasniewski, uh, Andrew Wilson, Farid Zakaria, and many other. Now Elena contributes to the translation team of uh, Ukrainska Pravda, uh, the biggest Ukrainian online newspaper, another interesting and very important part of her activity and expertise, working on the content for the international audience. Elina holds a master's degree in journalism from Kharkiv National University and master's degree in clinical psychology from the Kiev Institute of Modern Psychology and Psychotherapy. I would like to turn now to our speaker and invite her to offer her overview of the situation of the most recent events in about 15 to 20 minutes uh, with updates on the war. Then my colleague, Dr. Thiel, as he uh, already uh, told you, uh, and I will engage our guests uh, uh, in a conversation about uh, the current situation. Uh, and while we do that, uh, uh, you, the audience, are invited to type your own questions in the question and answer feature of Zoom. So we'll turn to them later. Uh, Ms. Beketova, you have the floor and all our attention now. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here at this virtual panel with the Florida International University. Thank you so much for inviting, for talking, for speaking about uh, Ukraine. And definitely right now, when we are living in the times, very uncertain times with a lot of wars, and it's um, obvious that the attention will be fading away uh, from Ukraine, but I'm here to talk about Ukraine and I'm here to answer all the questions. So I will be happy to, uh, when if you have, and when you have a lot of questions, I, I love answering all of them. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your warm presentation uh, of, of me. I don't think that I will add anything to it, but if you have any type of questions, please do, uh, do ask. Um, I'll probably concentrate on just, um, you know, uh, speaking about Ukraine and everything that we have right now, because, uh, today marks the 596 days of the full-scale Russian invasion and uh, Ukrainians are still fighting and they will be fighting. It's an existential threat to the nation, so that is why Ukrainians do not have any other option, you know, not to fight. And uh, when I was thinking about how to start my presentation, what to tell you, what is the main update on the war, what should I tell the respected audience that we have right now, because obviously, you know, everything and a lot of things, and uh, I was thinking about what you are interested in. I was, um, I was just uh, thinking about that I want to share my observations uh, from my, um, you know, trip to Kiev, uh, which was um, uh, like in August, so just a couple of months ago. And uh, I, was, I was just fascinated because regardless of the air raid sirens, missiles or drone attacks, Ukrainians leave, work, serve in the army, fundraise for the army, give birth to kids, drink coffee in the coffee bars, and uh, with the only exception that if you hear the air raid uh, announcement, you need to go to the shelter or to the underground because it's safe places where you need to be. Or if you are, uh, if you sit outside, um, you can just um, stay there on the street if you are brave enough, you know, and if you are not afraid of the air raid uh, announcements anymore. And this is what probably struck me the most that 
things that are not normal are getting to be normalized. So people are kind of, um, you know, kind of getting adjusted to living in the wartime situation, um, which is we all live right now. And as I will always say, there is no safe place in Ukraine right now, even though it's um, Kyiv with uh, better anti-missile defense systems uh, or Kherson, which is being shelled every day. Uh, which was liberated last year, if you remember. So right now there is um, there are no safe places in Ukraine, but people are resilient and people will be um, will be fighting. So um, as you know, um, well, we can definitely um, we can definitely talk about the front lines, but this is something that I always say there are military experts and they definitely analyze the situation on the battlefield every day because it changes very fast. I'm very cautious and uh, usually because I don't wanna, I know that a lot of people are fighting at this particular moment and they are liberating, you know, this one inch or two inches and uh, uh, I just don't wanna, um, you know, interfere with their actions uh, by saying that we liberated this or that and in reality it is not like that. Or on the contrary, saying that we haven't liberated it but we know that the battle, battles are there right now. But definitely I can tell you in general that the main battles right now are on the Pupinsk uh, front, uh, it's near Kharkiv region, and uh, we can just, uh, we, we, we can show the map, uh, the, the map of, um, uh, yes, this one, so that it was more clear. So right now the main battles are near Kharkiv region, uh, Pupinsk, uh, Marienka and Abdiyevka, Abdiyevka fronts uh, on the eastern eastern uh, side of Ukraine. And then um, Ukrainians are on the offensive on Melitopol, which is the, uh, near Zaporizhia uh, Oblast and um, Bakhmut fronts. It's, it's very important, uh, uh, you know, like uh, fronts for us. And uh, something that you probably know and you, uh, you see it, unfortunately, in use every day, uh, Kharkiv and Kherson are under constant challenge every day. Kharkiv is um, in the eastern part, uh, you can definitely see it, and uh, Kherson is the liberated region, uh, which was liberated last year, um, and uh, unfortunately shellings there happen every day, and I uh, analyze a lot of Telegram channels. Um, people who wanted to go back there, unfortunately they have to flee, this territory again and again because it's not safe there. Like in general, uh, this territory was liberated, for instance, but it doesn't mean that life is peaceful there. Um, so, and also the north of Ukraine, um, near Sume, uh, I don't know whether we have it. It's um, so it's on the north side of Ukraine. It's also um, it, it's being shelled also every day during night. So when, like in the morning, I see the reports uh, of the military, I see that this region is being shelled too. So it means that uh, right now there are like active uh, battles um, on the particular uh, fronts, but it doesn't mean that uh, there is some territory in Ukraine that is more or less safe. I mean, yes, people may say that the west of Ukraine is more safe, but it doesn't mean that it, it, it is not, um, you know, like attacked. So, well, definitely rarely, but it's still, it is still attack. So, um, as you all know, the war brought not only fatalities, casualties, and destructions of Ukrainian settlements, but also some of the Ukraine's territories are being occupied by the Russian forces. And thank you so much for uh, my presentation. Definitely at SIPA, I'm a democracy uh, fellow, and I focus on the temporarily occupied territories or recently liberated territories of Ukraine. And uh, part of the reason probably some people ask me why do I want to uh, focus on it because I'm from Crimea. So uh, you, you see it, Crimea there, the peninsula that was annexed in 2014. Um, I'm from the eastern part of uh, Crimea, which is Viadosia. It is not shown there, but it's the other side of Sevastopol, you know, so that it was more obvious for you. So it's closer to the um, this uh, carriage bridge and everything. everything. So carriage is not very far away from Piadosia. So, and um, well, definitely this is my interest and my focus because uh, I don't want any other, uh, you know, regions of Ukraine to go through everything that the peninsula went through uh, after the illegal annexation in 2014. So that is why I'm analyzing other regions, um, what they go through and how the situation is there and what strategies Russia uses there. So um, probably um, we, will, we can go to the page number seven, um, uh, just uh, to 
and uh, it's before page number seven, which was, yes. So as you all know, uh, Crimea was illegally annexed in 2014, and there are self-proclaimed Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republic, where hostilities also uh, started in 2014. And after the full-scale invasion in 2022, Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast have been partially occupied too, as we know. So before it, uh, Kharkiv and Kiev Oblasts were um, uh, partially um, occupied, but then liberated last year. And the same situation was with uh, Kherson, but right now Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblasts are partially occupied. So, and I would like to talk about these four processes that unfortunately take place in the occupied territories. And uh, um, unfortunately, they are happening more faster um, there than in the annexed Crimea. So, and I would like to, to talk about these four processes. They are Russification, propaganda, militarization, and resistance. So the first one, as we see, is Russification. So um, how does it look like? Um, I will be very general here, but if we would like, we can, um, you know, stop here more. So uh, Russification takes place in all the regions today that are uh, occupied. It exists in the forms of passportization, people are forced to obtain Russian passports. And when I get the question, but can people resist and don't get it? I say, well, it's possible just to be with the Ukrainian passport, but then um, you are excluded from the medical aid. So if you need to see a doctor, it is not possible to get any medical aid. And if you need any type of humanitarian aid, uh, if you don't have a Russian passport, uh, it also uh, complicates everything. So plus having only Ukrainian passport um, makes it easier for Russian forces to conduct different types of interrogations. So that is why for people living in the occupied territories, it is just safer to obtain this Russian passport. Then um, another, uh, another thing is Russian curriculums in kindergartens, schools, universities, um, well, it means that the Ukrainian textbooks are substituted with the Russian textbooks and the Ukrainian programs just uh, sub are substituted to the Russian ones. So um, different types of cultural projects with the other regions in Russia, because uh, Russia uh, launched so-called adoption programs. It was uh, even with Crimea, but right now with uh, Zaporizhia and other, um, and Kherson Oblast is getting even more faster. Um, it's when uh, like regions in Russia are linked to particular regions uh, in Ukraine and they need to help them in all type of uh, cultural projects you would uh, you would think of. We can also talk about it later. It's, it's not that uh, like Russia comes there and uh, it kills all the people, you know. Uh, there are subtle, subtle technologies and strategies that Russian forces use there, you know. And uh, it's not only because of uh, like constant hostilities that are there because Russian forces are shelling these territories, but it's also about the fact that um, the Russian forces or collaborators are doing there. So it's a very complex question. And uh, also, um, there is a strategy of importing specialists from Russia to temporarily occupied territories because there is a lack of specialists who uh, want to work or collaborate with the Russian forces there. So that is why Russia has to bring people there who would be collaborating with them. In uh, these situations, they will need to import people from different other regions um, to Ukraine. For, for example, in August, Russian doctors from one of the St. Petersburg hospitals arrived in occupied Kahovka, which is in Kherson Oblast. They receive an allowance for working in war zones. So before this position, these doctors worked in Syria. Uh, so it's just one case, but uh, just like explaining what is going on there. Uh, then we can proceed to the next slide. Uh, propaganda exists uh, in all the types. Um, so uh, people are exposed to a lot of um, information uh, and they don't have alternatives. Uh, so it means that when the territory is occupied, it is closed and uh, people are oppressed and uh, people, people don't have an opportunity to uh, have their previous identities if they want to survive and live. Uh, because unfortunately, um, if uh, you have uh, the pro-Ukrainian, Ukrainian views and you want to stay 
as you are, it will be very difficult for you to live in that circumstances. So that is why people have to adjust if they want to, if they don't have an opportunity to flee the territory that is temporarily occupied by Russian forces, they have to constantly adjust to what is going on there. And unfortunately, this is um, a very terrible process that is uh, suppressing the Ukrainian identity and it has a lot of consequences but we can definitely talk about it later. So, and um, people are exposed to the state propaganda television, which uh, as we know, justifies all the hostilities and calls the war a special military operation. And uh, it also exists in all types of cultural events, projects uh, where most messages underline uh, that something was done within Russia or as an all Russian project to make the point that occupied Ukraine is allegedly part of the motherland. So it's, uh, as I call, that in the majority of cases, um, there are different subtle methods of uh, influencing people who are living on these territories. And uh, in the majority of cases, when people don't have an opportunity to flee, to leave this territory, then they are exposed to all this type of falsification programs, propaganda machine. And uh, this is what makes the whole process uh, very, very um, terrible, I would say, yes. And uh, this picture that you are seeing, it's um, it's taken in Melitopol, the Parisia Oblast, which was occupied in March 2022. Uh, this is the museum, Russia, my history. And uh, you would be surprised, but the deputy head of the presidential administration of Russia, Sergei Kiryenko, even uh, came over to Melitopol to open uh, this propaganda museum. So it tells about the history of Ukrainian Zaporizhia Oblast and Russia, and everything underlines there that this is allegedly one nation, one country, one face, and one language. This is what is done in all of these uh, cultural uh, propaganda or whatever projects. So um, unfortunately, this is um, blurring uh, the Ukrainian identity and uh, suppress suppressing everything Ukrainian and just to imposing everything Russian and uh, where people don't have an opportunity to 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 say anything else or to um, they do have an opportunity to resist but it's very dangerous but we will talk about it later then another processes that uh, takes place there is called militarization and we can go to the next uh, slide yes so this is uh, the conscription of people who obtained Russian passports so according to Russian laws if uh, you get the Russian passport, you are a subject to conscription. And it doesn't mean that uh, you will be conscripted, but it means that after a person gets this Russian passport, he or she has to go to the military enlistment office and register there. It means that this military enlistment office will have the data on this particular person. So, and, um, uh, well, uh, there are a lot of, in, there is a lot of information um, on the Telegram channels saying that people are conscripted, like in Donetsk or Lugansk Oblast, which were occupied for nine years, even more in the same situation in Crimea. Um, they say that it's it's very hard for people not to be conscripted. So uh, usually this is what is done uh, by Russia, because um, as we know, all this mobilization campaign and conscription campaign, when it doesn't work, they just conscript people in these temporarily occupied territories. So uh, above of the fact that these territories are just uh, occupied, all the people are subjects to this conscription and they have to, uh, to go to the army and serve the Russian army. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, that's the, you, you can understand the terrible effect on people and everything, but this is what is going on there. And um, there, there are different types of Kozak, Kadet, and other uniformed quasi-military organizations in schools, where basically um, members are overseen um, by supervisors from the military or law enforcement agencies. And they, um, like the kids are taught uh, um, to assemble, disassemble a machine gun, as well as attending lessons in the workings of the Russian government and legal system. So basically, um, children are exposed to, again, propaganda, russification, and everything 
uh, is taught in like Russian, about Russian history, uh, about how everything is, is done in Russian and so on and so forth. And uh, well, you all probably know about that, the movement of the first. It's, it's a very popular uh, movement in Russia and the version of the Soviet era young pioneers with the mission to educate the patriotic spirit of youth. So after the um, temporary occupation of these lands, definitely Russia uh, conducted all the types of uh, this centrist movement of the first and Unarmia, which is a Moscow-based military patriotic movement, which prepares children to serve in the Russian armed forces. Um, they have opened uh, multiple centers in the temporarily occupied Ukrainian territories, where um, some reports say that parents cannot uh, resist and cannot just uh, refuse giving their child to this center because uh, sometimes they are threatened uh, that they will be uh, just, uh, you know, uh, that they will be, um, that they will have some fines or sanctions or that they will take away this kid from this parent. So there are like multiple stories. Unfortunately, um, like I cannot verify all the sources, but I see a lot of stories that people don't have uh, the rights to refuse, you know, so this, this is. And also treatment camps and, and educational trips to the Russian Federation. This is also something that I uh, constantly talk about because when we think about this temporarily occupied ter territory that is closed and it's like a black box, you would think that uh, people, uh, well, it, it is a reality that unfortunately people don't have an opportunity to um, to offer something to their kids. And if someone approaches and says that, you know, we have a wonderful treatment camp somewhere in Russia or Dagestan or uh, some other place, uh, why wouldn't you send it? Uh, why, why wouldn't you send your kid there? In the majority of cases, parents uh, have to uh, agree because they don't have any other option. So if they cannot, uh, if they don't have an opportunity to flee this territory, if they, uh, for some reason, they have to stay there, they don't have an opportunity to give their kids something else. So that is why they uh, agree on uh, sending their kids somewhere to the treatment camps. And this treatment camp, uh, we obviously understand it's not only about uh, educational or cultural programs somewhere in the Museum of Russia, but that's a lot of propaganda and um, it's a lot of exposure to this propaganda. And um, I just found this uh, fascinating number. The next slide will show it. Uh, about 47 million US dollars are planned to be allocated to the implementation of the federal project Patriotic Education of, uh, of Citizens of the Russian Federation in 2024. Uh, that's the draft budget submitted to the State Duma, but um, they, um, they want to allocate a lot of uh, like the I guess seven millions or something like this to Unarmia and movement of the first. So these are the movements that I told you about that are uh, there are about militarization of the education. Uh, it's about militarization of uh, children. And um, yes, so that's pretty much it. And um, the last but not the, the least, of course, is the resistance movement, because um, we all understand that the military can succeed without the support of the local population. And this um, even non-violent uh, resistance is a highly effective mechanism for fighting the enemy. And um, firstly, passing on information about the location and number of equipment and personnel is important. And there is a um, special national resistance center, uh, which explains how to do it and by what means uh, to be effective and as safe as possible. Uh, there was a number, I thought, to share it with you that in the spring of 2022, when we had Mm, more territories occupied in Zaporizhia, in Kherson Oblast. Um, uh, there is a special manual on the National Resistance Center uh, whose primary function is educational. Um, it educates how to pass on information and be safe. And it was downloaded 100,000 times, and then it was copied, and then it was distributed. And uh, of course, um, there is, um, secondly, it's, it's a very important part, it's a psychological pressure, graffiti, patriotic or threatening flyers, Ukrainian symbols, and um, thirdly, it's uh, like slowing down the Russians' advance. Uh, this is what foresters, for instance, in Suma Oblast did. They chopped trees down, preventing whole columns from getting through. Uh, yeah. So there are different uh, vivid examples of how the resistance movement works, but 
uh, well, definitely, you know, that uh, yellow ribbon movement, uh, th this is one of the most particular and popular ones because it's just a non-violent uh, resistance movement where people in the temporarily occupied territories can uh, hand somewhere this yellow ribbon. And it means that, um, you know, it's uh, one of the color of the uh, Ukrainian flag. So meaning that people do resist, people don't want to uh, wait uh, till the moment that people do wait till the moment when the armed forces of Ukraine will liberate this territory. It, it means kind of like this symbol that people do wait. And for me, this is the most highest, uh, you know, um, I would say um, highest uh, sign of heroism when people uh, in the territories that were occupied for nine years, they still have this ability to hand this, uh, you know, yellow ribbon, because it means that they still do uh, wait, even though it's like nine or 10 years. So, and another movement, as you all know, is a TASH movement. Uh, it's, um, it was, uh, uh, it was created in September, 2022, to carry out sabotage against the Russian army. And, uh, well, there were a number of reports that Atash claimed responsibility for, for instance, bombing a United Russia campaign office in Novakakovka, uh, where there was the sham elections this particular autumn, uh, killing three Russian guards, destroying documents supporting the sham elections in the region. And there were other reports where Atash took responsibility and claimed responsibility for um, you know, uh, putting on an explosion in someone's car and or targeting some of the collaborators. So their aim is more or less to um, to uh, help the Ukrainian uh, armed forces and to uh, defeat the Russian army or the representatives of the collaborators. So it's it's more or less this one, but uh, you know, uh, sabotage can exist in different forms because according to the National Resistance Centers, um, there was um, in the temporarily occupied territory of the Kherson region, there have been cases of electricians disabling the power grid. Utility workers failed to repair the premises of the new so-called administrations, blaming a shortage of materials and fuel or one hospital director simulated a COVID epidemic in order to avoid uh, treating in Russian soldiers. So there are different examples of this non-violent resistance and it still uh, exists. And uh, one of the fascinating things that I found really interesting was when uh, Kherson Oblast was uh, liberated uh, last year, uh, we we saw that uh, it was the in intensification of the resistance movement in Crimea, which is in the south, right? Because people felt this hope that they saw, okay, Kherson region was occupied, but then it was liberated. So we we would better show that we are still waiting for the armed forces too. And there were a lot of patriotic, uh, uh, you know, like graffitis. A lot of people were detained there because it's not possible to, um, you know, go somewhere and protest. But um, it was also something very interesting. It's pretty much it, and I'm happy to answer all of your questions, which you will have. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's uh, a lot to talk about, and I already have sort of a couple of questions. So uh, what we're going to do, and I'm glad to see actually that in the Q&A box, there are questions coming in. So please do post your questions. And if you only if you have a question, then uh, quickly identify yourself so we know who you are. Um, but before we do that, before we get to your questions, um, we just want to ask you um, a few questions. And I, I have one slash two um, that relate to sort of the Russification and uh, it's also got to do a little bit with the propaganda, right? So the first part is sort of um, since Russification is sort of very sort of a interesting um, occupying tactic, um, are there differences, you know, in the... Eastern Ukrainian region as opposed to Crimea, right, in terms of how Russification um, happens. And related to that, because it's also about um, the resistance and propaganda, I, I read that um, I think in Russia itself, a satiricist or comedian put up a defamation app as a joke, but that suddenly became very successful, right, in defaming anti-war Russians. 
does something like this also exist in eastern Ukraine? You know, is are these tactics also used to kind of get the population in line? So those are one slash two of my questions. Oh, thank you so much for for your questions. Uh, well, it's uh, you know I, I would think that I'm not really sure that this type exists uh, in the east part of Ukraine. But what I have noticed is that all the recification programs and campaigns, unfortunately. Um, happen more faster right now in the newly occupied territories of Zaporizhia and Kherson Oblast because, uh, well, I think that uh, the strategies that and programs that were first uh, tested in Crimea and then in uh, Lugansk or Donetsk People's Republic, they were easily uh, imposed in other newly occupied territories. And like a simple example, you know, like if you had a Ukrainian passport and you were living with it happily somewhere in Crimea, um, like on the fourth year after the annexation, uh, imagine all the um, like all the fines and violations of of law happen right now in the newly occupied territories because people are forced to take this Russian passport. While in Crimea, it was still, for instance, possible for people to exist with the, the Ukrainian passport, and they uh, had some time not to register the documents. So it was more wide in time. While right now, it is like everything happening super fast. Uh, well, I, my observation is that this is because they tested everything in Crimea or in this part of Ukraine, and that is why they are doing it very fast in the newly occupied territories. So this is, uh, this is what I have noticed, and unfortunately that is why I'm telling that the faster Ukraine will get all the you know, needed weapon systems and can liberate all the territories, the faster we can, uh, you know, um, work with the consequences of this occupation. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, my question is uh, related more to the outcome of, uh, of the war. So the, think about the following scenario, uh, that uh, Ukraine ends up with total victory, territorial so that uh, it keeps the eastern provinces that are now occupied by Russia. At the same time, this may make it more difficult to become a NATO member. Uh, there are proponents of the idea for a more restrained approach to such a scenario. What do you believe might happen if Ukraine um, finds itself in, in such a scenario? Uh, here, I have in mind that uh, Ukraine already could not keep control over Lugansk and Donetsk in the period 2014-2022. Uh, would it be difficult for the country to keep uh, peace uh, and uh, democratize these, uh, these regions as well? Uh, thank you so much, Jana, for your question. Uh, well, I think that it won't be difficult for Ukrainian authorities to restore its power and to work with the reintegration of these territories, understanding that those people, unfortunately, were uh, exposed to a lot of uh, propaganda there and that they uh, have been living under it for, uh, with it, uh, you know, for many, many years. But I know that there are a lot of strategies right now um, being discussed and uh, were being worked out in terms of reintegrating these territories because uh, well I, I feel that um, you know it's 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 very difficult to to talk about any type of concessions because it will be concession uh, from the Ukrainian side but it doesn't mean that we will be safe afterwards you know the example of Crimea clearly showed that if we wait more time then we will have more conse more consequences in the future. So unfortunately, at first, it was like this method uh, of negotiations that people were thinking that, you know, it's probably through uh, your diplomatic means that Crimea will be liberated and everything. But then when in nine years, the whole of Ukraine uh, is, um, you know, experiencing the full-scale aggression and invasion by the Russian soldiers and forces, those people who believed that it's possible to negotiate and talk about and to get peace for that, now we see that it's not possible. So the strategy, uh, unfortunately, why I say unfortunately, because it means that uh, we will be losing a lot of people still because it's the war, but we don't have any other option, you know, to fight 
and to fight for our freedom and to uh, to fight to liberate all these territories. Even though I understand a lot of my friends, a lot of friends of my friends, a lot of beloved ones will be injured or dead because unfortunately that's the only thing right now that we have to, to go through. And uh, well, only, you know, Putin's effort to reestablish the Russian empire, which threatens all of Europe, including NATO allies, that were formerly occupied by Russia uh, must be stopped in, in Ukraine because Russian forces um, should be defeated and withdrawn. I would say withdrawn from all the Ukrainian territory. Anything less will set the stage for future war in Europe and uh, in which the United States, for instance, may face a treaty obligation to defend uh, NATO allies, you know. So that is why right now, unfortunately, everything is going on on our territory and we are losing a lot of people. But it doesn't mean that if we stop and say, OK, let's just keep this territory or this territory and this territory and we will be safe. No, it's a misperception of everything. And this is scary. Yeah, yeah if, if I may just say it's it's not with, whether uh, whether Ukraine would give up on this territory. It's more about the plans how to reintegrate them uh, in a way that it will be a sustained progress there and success. Uh, I'm sure that it won't be an easy process. I agree with you uh, because it definitely requires a lot of efforts and um, a lot of understanding uh, from this side of Ukraine to understand what, what these people were going through and that, uh, well, I wrote the piece about even uh, people, residents of Crimea, because right now we are in the process of discussing, uh, you know, uh, who were collaborating with Russian forces and what they did there, because uh, obviously people stayed there, they lived there, they worked, and it means that uh, are they ones to blame? for, um, you know, for this collaboration with Russian forces. And there are particular, there is a law right now uh, by the Ukrainian authority that says actually who will be prosecuted for what. But it's, uh, if to say it very, um, if to say it very simple, you know, those people who, um, you know, were working as judges and uh, detaining, uh, you know, Ukrainians for their pro-Ukrainian views, uh, probably they will be persecuted because they they had this their their acts had a lot of consequences. So, but that's like my very simple explanation. There is a law, and uh, like it it distinguish uh, it distinguishes uh, what a person might have done and what are the uh, you know liability or responsibility for that. But like in the majority of cases, if a person even like worked as a teacher. And the law says that, uh, like, if a person worked and, uh, you know, imposed Russian uh, narratives or Russian standards in the education, he or she uh, might be illustrated, so he cannot or she cannot uh, take the, this position in future as a t teacher. But there are still a lot of discussions, but I'm sure um, it will take time, efforts, and a lot of understanding. But I'm sure as the Ukraine is a democratic country, we are able to go through it and we are able to do it because we understand what it means that we are all different, but only when we are together and in this, uh, you know, particular, uh, uh, you know, territories that we have according to our constitution, we can deal with all the future consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to see that there are a number of questions coming in. So what I would suggest is that um, my colleague, Professor Costadino, and I will take turns in sort of asking you uh, questions from our audience. And so if you don't mind, let me start right away, because I, I would like to kind of merge two similar questions that reflect partly what you said. And this is sort of, you know, some of the pre-existing issues, I think particularly sort of with Russian identity in the Eastern region. So Sore Akrami, um, a PhD student in international relations, she asked, um, based on some data, some citizens of Ukraine actually fled to Russia, which shows this, this desire to be ruled by Russia, right? So before and after the Russian invasion, what was the prevailing opinion of the people in the occupied territories? And then Ryan Coleman, a grad student, in political science, focusing on Eastern Europe, he has a similar question in which he asked um, if Eastern Ukrainians in the breakaway republics of the East actually identify with Russian identity, uh, or do you think that you know their cessation movement may be a product of post-Soviet transition dissatisfaction, right? 
So thanks if you could somehow speak to both of these questions. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So uh, I'll probably go with the first uh, with the first uh, question, right, Zohre? Um, that uh, some citizens of Ukraine fled to Russia. Uh, well, uh, see, uh, I think that um, the, the interesting part is that uh, when the war um, is happening on the territory, we cannot ask people there what they think. Because in the majority of cases, people are ruled by just uh, a simple desire to survive and to be somewhere in a safe place. So we have, uh, for instance, these cases when people from Mariupol fled to Russia. Does it mean that they support Russia and that they uh, want to be ruled by Russia? It simply means that uh, they are, um, they have, uh, you know, Russian border in 60 kilometers, you know? It means that it's very close to them to go to Russia rather than to go through hostilities to the Ukraine controlled territory. And we have a lot of cases like this. So people, when they are, um, when they are in the situation where they can be killed, injured, or um, simply not survive, they um, sometimes choose this option to survive. And that is why they go to Russia. Doesn't mean that they wanna be ruled. I don't know anything about it, you know? So I think that only if uh, we, we, we can talk about all these things uh, that like, do people want to be ruled by Russia only when we have a uh, peace, peace territory, you know, when people have the right to express their views, uh, to have democratic principles and polls and service or referendums. But this is, uh, this can happen only when this territory is free from the hostilities or from people with weapons, because if you do have both, and uh, hostilities, the war, people in, with weapons. You simply cannot think about like who you want to be ruled by. You know, like you are. If you live there, probably you are okay with the uh, you know the country that you lived in because Russia invaded Ukraine. You know, so a lot of people. That's a simple example. I lived in Kharkiv for many years, and people from Russia would come to uh, shop in the grocery stores in Kharkiv because they were simply cheaper than in Belgorod. So imagine a lot of cars with Russian plates were there because it was like this, you know, that's, it means that when, uh, you know, two cities are, um, are near the border, they probably, uh, you know, go back and forth. And a lot of people would go and have some work in Russia, but it doesn't mean that uh, they want to be ruled by Russia. It means that sometimes people would get better salaries there. So uh, my point is that only when we have a peaceful land, a peaceful territory, it is possible to hold any type of, I don't know, like referendums, elections or whatever, and see people's, what people really think. In this situation, it's a stressful situation and people just try to survive. Thank okay. you. Yeah, they cannot... um... yeah, please go ahead. Looking at the questions, I also want to merge two questions because they are very similar or in the same direction. Uh, Timur Habibulin, who is from mm -hmm. my, my class on Russian politics, uh, is an international relations major here at FAU. Uh, he is concerned about uh, corruption in Ukraine and the way foreign aid is uh, distributed. So his question is, uh, uh, could you touch on how this uh, affects the distribution of foreign aid, the presence of corruption in the country, in terms of funds and arms uh, munitions? Where does this money actually go and where could it end up? Uh, and uh, another student who is a graduate student, PhD student in the International Relations Program, um, Ms. Anna Andreeva, she also asks about corruption in Ukraine uh, and how this may affect the distribution of uh, aid in the country and possible misuse of, uh, of those funds. So her question is how much progress has Ukraine's government made against corruption as it fights two wars uh, uh, at the same time, one against Russia, but the other one is trying to combat corruption. Well, thank you so much for both questions. And I think they are important in terms of understanding, right? Uh, how everything is uh, working in Ukraine right now, because we have to uh, both uh, uh, work with, um, we, we have to, uh, you know, fight on the battlefield, but we also have to fight with the internal problems we might have and we might see them. I don't think that, uh, you know, like the narrative about Ukraine being a corrupted country, it's, uh, 
I perceive it slightly, I perceive it wrong because we uh, definitely show that uh, we, even though we might have these problems, we have a pro we, we can see progress in terms of uh, uh, fighting with the corruption because we have a lot of uh, new authorities that have to work with this, um, you know, cases because we have anti-corruption, um, we have National Anti-Corruption Bureau, we have uh, Prosecutor's Office, we have uh, uh, Corruption and National uh, Anti-Corruption Court, and there are uh, different attempts and uh, efforts that show us that we are different. We are not that we were in 2014, when people might say that, you know, you're a corrupted country. Right now we see definitely the efforts battling with this corruption. And uh, I think that it's, it's very, um, it, it's, it's very, interesting and uh, it should be uh, clear that when we have uh, and you definitely can can see it, that when we have this uh, corruption scandals um, related to some of the ministries or to particular people we see the results that those people were detained uh, those people were um, you know accused of something and there is a court decision uh, according to it. So that is why I think that should be a signal to all of us, people from Ukraine, that it, it has changed and we, we know that it has changed. And uh, it's a signal to all the international, um, you know, uh, allies and partners who are giving us uh, a lot of aid right now because of what we can uh, be in this uh, marathon of uh, fighting with the Russians, you know, uh, with the other army, which is bigger than ours, of course. But it means that uh, I think it, it works in both directions, meaning that if Ukraine uh, didn't show any good results in terms of battling with the corruption, probably we wouldn't be getting enough of, uh, you know, weapons and weapon systems to defend ourselves to defend our state and our identity. Great, thank you. And if I may add to that um, before asking the next questions, um, you know, just from the EU side that I know better, right? I, um, in order to become an EU member state and, and Ukraine has been declared and or has, has been accepted as an EU member state after the Russian invasion, right? In June, 2022, as an EU candidate, official EU candidate state. In order to do that, however, a country needs to undergo a number of reforms, 35 different policy chapters and the European Union is looking very closely. Of course, I think also um, in sort of a informed estimate, you know, in war times, you cannot always control, right, where the money is going and what the money is being used to, because used for, because you don't have the all the planning and then, you know, like the 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 reporting mechanisms and all the all of that in place. But in general, um, for the longer term EU accession process, I would think uh, um, looking at Ukraine's corruption, particularly after the European Union's experience in accepting previously Central Eastern European member states who have still till today issues with that, right? The European Union has also had a learning effect and this will be looking much more closely at the issue of corruption in, in Ukraine. Plus, um, I mean, while there's a general EU unity, there's also EU skeptics about Ukraine, right? In part, you know, for a number of reasons, but in part because accepting EU uh, Ukraine too early into the EU would mean, you know, like you're basically getting a, a frontal war, right? Basically, they want to um, keep Ukraine out at least until after the the war is over. Um, because they don't want to get a, it drawn into a war. And so corruption, also the assertion of corruption in Ukraine also serves for skeptics within the EU to kind of keep, you know, Ukraine out for the for the time being. I think it's also a politi stra uh, politi political strategy by some of uh, the skeptical folks within the EU. But that's just a little commentary. I want to get... Yeah. I, I ahead, agree please, with you, Marcus. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think that uh, you know a lot of narratives saying that uh, Ukraine is a uh, corrupted country. You know, not uh, well. You know, we have to handle both sides. It doesn't mean that we are perfect, but it doesn't mean that we are too bad. You know, so we are somewhere in between. Meaning, there are issues, there are problems, but it's good when we see the results of uh, someone is detained for this corruption. Then there is a court decision then there is everything that is happening uh, in other in any other European country. You know, S uh, saying that any other European country is perfect in terms of battling corruption, it means that, uh, well, probably there is an index showing that it's better, but let's see what is in reality, you know. So uh, I think that the main thing is this rule of law. So when we will have it, when we'll have the precedent, the case, 
and you know all these people won't be um, won't be holding their positions anymore and uh, they will be persecuted for what they have done you know then it shows that yes we are following all the rules and we are following the rule of law thank you um i want to answer i uh, want, want you ask a question that also again combines two contributions by our audience um one is and because it also relates to what i wanted to ask you as well um sorry um asks again um in your opinion what effect does the conflict in the middle east right now have on the war between ukraine and russia right and then the other question by Alejandro Alvarez, who is a political science student um, from Professor Kosadinova, he has also, in light of these recent events in the Middle East, um, will obtaining resources from the US Congress be more or less difficult in the short and long term, right? And that's independent just of the, you know, the potentiality of a Trump administration coming in next year in after the US elections. So please. Well, uh, well, thank you so much for combining those questions. You know, uh, I, I just think that um, Ukraine, and when we talk about Ukraine or Israel, um, I, I someone saw this phrase uh, because it's a brief phrase. Uh, like every peaceful country is alike, every war-torn country is war-torn in its own way. Meaning that uh, definitely uh, right now, and you you probably saw it that uh, the the president of Ukraine uh, said that the only difference is that there is a terrorist organization that attacked Israel, and uh, in Ukraine there is a terrorist state that attacked Ukraine. Uh, the intentions declared are different, but the essence is the same, right? So we we um, I would probably give it to um, Middle East experts who are in this topic because from what I have read, you know, and uh, from what I'm seeing is that uh, they say that, um, for instance. Uh, they, if Ukraine and Israel are different places facing different threats, there is much about both of them that should call on our sympathy and uh, support. They have been both uh, the victims of the war crimes. Both are battling forces that hate the United States and the West and that receive backing uh, from Iran. But there are obviously differences because uh, Israel is a well-established, uh, stable democracy. And, uh, you know, the level of support required by Ukraine, um, which, as we know, was invaded by a larger, uh, you know, country and uh, is, is now engaged in a large scale uh, war is much higher. So I, I just think that um, it's, it's good when uh, people try to combine it. I just feel that uh, we definitely have different problems and different problems in terms of even, um, you know, weapon systems that we will need. Uh, because uh, as many experts say that Ukraine, while Ukraine needs more weapons, uh, Israel uh, needs more diplomatic support, uh, especially in the coming days. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's say that... Uh, not all the questions directly overlap with uh, Ukraine's needs and war. While right now I see that, yes, there is this uh, intention to kind of link both problems just because you know, both wars, right, and everything that is going on, uh, because Ukraine needs this aid. And uh, if we are linked to Israel, then there is more possibility that we will get this aid. Um, but, you know, we, we don't know the outcome. We don't know how it will be. But I just definitely, well, can say that, you know, there are some similarities, but there are differences. And this is the, the same situation as probably you all uh, see sometimes with the Taiwan question that sometimes is, uh, you know, touched upon when talking about Ukraine, that the U.S. will probably need all these uh, weapon systems or something for Taiwan while uh, there are multiple evidence saying that um, there will be just a little bit of overlapping. So because Ukraine needs other systems than Taiwan would need in the future. So I think that uh, there are some similarities, but there are differences. And I would probably um, say that Middle East experts here are more um, you know, relevant okay. with understanding what is the, the war in Israel. And, Thank you. Uh, why it has been happening since 1948, you know. And sort of, so, you know, with regards to the U.S. side, um, I mean, you're based in D.C., right? Um, so I'm based in D.C. You I'm must, based must be sort of right now scrambling to, you know, with what's going on in Congress and everything. 
to make sure to ensure continued funding for Ukraine. Right? Definitely, definitely. We are all analyzing and we are all, uh, you know, like kind of uh, following all the news. But, you know, it, it, it will be how it will be. We will see it. But I hope for the best, of course. And I hope that the aid uh, will be continuing because this is very essential. This is very vital. And this is something that we keep on going, you know. But uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are probably other questions, right? Yeah, thinking please. about thinking about the other side, about Russia and Russian citizens. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Andri Durigin. Mm -hmm. How do you see the possible role of citizens of the Russian Federation who are currently abroad, particularly in the United States, in ending this war? Uh, well, Andri, thank you so much for your question. I think that, um, you know, like with the... Uh, with the whole thing um, that right now, um, even in our program, we have uh, five Ukrainians and uh, we have four uh, people from uh, Russia and uh, they are trying, we are in the constant discussions about everything, what is going on. And uh, I just feel that um, the support uh, to end the war, it means that people have to realize, well, what I come across sometimes, when people uh, do not take, take the responsibility for what is going on. And sometimes this strategy of denial that uh, Russia invaded Ukraine with a full-scale invasion. This is something that I come across uh, with uh, sometimes. Meaning that uh, not all people, uh, well, we realize that of course not all people in Russia support the war, but unfortunately they don't have means to, um, you know, uh, to kind of resist and to do something if they don't want to spend their time in prisons in Russia. So that is why we understand that a lot will be a line on the uh, shoulders of people who live somewhere uh, outside of Russia, but they still want to um, to help Ukrainians. Well, it's, it's spreading the word about what is going on. First, uh, spreading the word about uh, those people and, um, you know, like launching some campaigns that will help people who don't want to serve in the Russian army to help those people. Because there are uh, obviously a lot of people who don't want to do it, but they don't have a right to do it right now. So uh, why wouldn't those people help uh, their, uh, you know, like citizens to kind of uh, not, go th not go to the Russian army and not to serve there? So there are definitely, um, you know, means how they can do it. Well, there are multiple, uh, you know, there are multiple uh, theories and views that uh, sometimes Ukrainians would say that uh, Russian citizens do not do anything abroad. They do not protest. They do not uh, support Ukraine. So it's not obvious what is the role of those people, right? But I would think that if uh, there will be more rallies, protests in the countries where they can do it, and uh, being more vocal about what is going on and that people have other choice, uh, especially those people who live uh, within Russia, because in the majority of cases, those people are afraid and they, they are in the constant fear that if they do something wrong, they will be persecuted, detained and uh, in the prison, you know? So uh, being in an, uh, an alternative uh, source of information for them and being their support if they need it, if uh, some people don't want to serve in the army, what what they are supposed to do? Will they need? They will need a uh, lawyer's help and everything. How to do it? You know. So I, I, I'm sure there are multiple ways uh, how to help, but it's up to Russian citizens to 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 kind of uh, to do it with their country because it's their future. They will be democratiz uh, democratizing this country in the future and they will be hoping for the better future for their country. We are hoping, you know, Ukrainians are hoping for liberating of our territories. This is what we want to do and what we need to do. You know, we are thinking about our things that we are responsible for, you know, and uh, if right now we will be thinking about uh, how Russian citizens should do and what they do, I think we will just collapse all of us. So I think it's a division of different campaigns. So we have to think about our things. They have to definitely try to help as they can. We all understand that it's not easy, but they should find the ways. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we have about 10 minutes uh, left. So let's see if we can get through the questions, but I would wanna take um, Ryan's uh, question of, you know, 
he asks if you think that the volunteer battalions have contributed to strengthening Ukrainian identity, right? If you can I'm just sorry, uh, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for the question. I'm just trying to understand uh, what volunteer battalions, because right now we have uh, the territorial defense forces, but they are already in the defense forces of Ukraine, meaning that at first when the full-scale invasion started, um, you know, the uh, people who didn't have um, this previous experience of serving in the army, they went to serve, uh, like people would just go to the local uh, enlistment office of the territorial uh, defense forces and they would serve there. And uh, we have multiple examples when, because of those people um, who are in this uh, volunteer battalions, we, uh, we, we could fight some territory or we could liberate some territories because people just didn't give the right to the Russian army to proceed with their actions there. So it means that people just uh, without any uh, experience before, they took a gun or they took some weapon that they had that they were given and they went to defend their land because they were from there. Well, we had this multiple examples in Kherson region and uh, there was a uh, very, uh, like unfortunately sad battle when those people who didn't have it, they were in the territorial defense forces and they went to defend their land because they, they simply said that we don't have any other territory, we need to defend ours. And the same was happening in Bakhmut because with the um, regular like defense uh, forces of Ukraine, there were a lot of uh, volunteers who just uh, uh, joined and who would be doing it just because they didn't have any other option. Uh, well, everyone understands right now, if we don't stop it, uh, well, Russia, unfortunately, won't just stop because they have realized that they did a mistake, you know, so it's our, uh, unfortunately, thing to stop them. I would like to, to turn to Jennifer Melchiavez's uh, question now. She starts by saying that, by asking, is there an example in history of such wars over territory and state sovereignty being solved by diplomatic means, first and foremost. So she questions that. Uh, the idea of continuation of aggressive military force such as that, which has been over the, in Gaza is devastating and finding ethical justification in war is too com complicated. So her question, are there no prospects to do political intervention to discuss negotiations? Is it a, uh, Happy dream. So this is this is her question about how to how to achieve peace. Oh, Diplomatic uh, means versus yeah. Jennifer, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I mean, I'm also, I think I, I've been always a person who would vote for any type of diplomatic mean if we had it. But my particular situation in my case that I'm from Crimea and I truly believe that it's possible to kind of, you know, negotiate and to have uh, any type of peace talks in the future will lead to uh, Ukraine regaining control over the territory. And then nine, uh, nine years after, after that, I was the one who was fleeing the country just because the Russian forces came from all the different sides. So for me, the idea of peaceful talks and negotiations with Russia, unfortunately, right now, don't work, just, just doesn't work just because I uh, went through it. But I'm sure there are other wars and other type of uh, hostilities uh, in the history of uh, our world, which, uh, which, which can definitely show us that peace talks and negotiations can work. It's just uh, with the, the case of Ukraine right now and the full-scale aggression of Russia, the only thing that we can do is to uh, get the needed weapon systems, liberate all these territories, our territories, and then we will be rebuilding our country, reintegrating all these territories with a lot of complex things, but we will definitely do. But right now, at this point, I don't think that there is a place, a space for these uh, negotiations because it will be simply giving away our territories and that it wouldn't mean that we would get peace for it, unfortunately. Thank you. And I, we have one more question, one comment by Timur, and then one more question um, that I want to ask by Theo Kambakian. He is a student in my class, and he is concerned, you know, with sort of the basic needs for Ukrainians on the war front, right? Sort of by, by Eastern Ukraine. Um, having in mind those, these people must survive, 
how can Ukraine manage these basic needs for their people? I think that's particularly compelling after what you said, you know, at the beginning that you realize there are some attempts at normalization or normal life going on in Western Ukraine, right? Or Central Ukraine, but the Eastern Ukrainian situation is probably very different. I mean, it, it is, but I, I didn't get the question. So should we wait until the war is... We, we can't, uh, unfortunately, we can't hold any type of referendums or elections right now because they won't be simply representing the uh, people's views right now. So Ukraine doesn't have an access to the temporarily occupied territories right now. Uh, there are Russian forces standing, Russian soldiers, the same with the uh, international community. Um, any international organization or observers won't get the right to be there unless there are uh, Russian soldiers. So right now we don't have an opportunity to hold any type of referendums uh, and elections. Where did I? Yeah, I no, no. I, I Theo, I kind of asked Theo the second one on the bottom. He asked about so the, how does Ukraine? How can Ukraine ensure the basic needs of the people on the front, basically of Ukrainians on the front? You know. Uh, so, uh, the people on the front, okay, so it's, um, we have, uh, the army, which is, uh, defending the territory, and we have the defense forces who are supplied by the, uh, defend, by the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, and we have tons of volunteers. So, if you have someone in the, uh, battalion, and you know that they need this particular drone right now, you will be fundraising for this particular drone because they need it. So uh, it's it's like the constant uh, thing right now. I love this expression that it's not that the Ukrainian military needs a particular truck or a drone. It's all the people right now needed uh, there. So we have multiple tons of different fundraisers, and like my uh, like YouTube or Instagram or Facebook uh, feed is all about fundraising right now because people have someone there and they know exactly what they need, and sometimes it's faster to deliver it to them if you just fundraise this money delivered it there. What about people? So we have the uh, volunteers who help to evacuate people from um, the front lines. So uh, you would be surprised that, I mean, that's a, uh, that's a tragedy that happened in Kharkiv last week when there was a funeral of one of the um, military and uh, there was a Russian missile hit uh, of this particular place. And imagine like more than 50 people died out of uh, 300 living there. So every six person uh, was, was killed. It means that uh, sometimes people living in the front line, this is their, um, I mean, the situation is of course uh, not very easy. It's complicated. It's, uh, it's complicated in terms of uh, like safety, but people do stay there because they um, probably want to stay there. They uh, have someone um, defending. That is why they can't uh, leave this particular place. And uh, it's not easy. This is what I'm always saying, even when people ask, why don't all people uh, like leave uh, Crimea? Because it's not possible, because people have different stuff. Like if you are told right now, you know, uh, there, is, there are hostilities and you hear them, but you always have this idea that maybe it's something that everything will be okay. Like you probably will survive and that because you just don't want to, you reject the idea that your life has already changed and you need to take a decision. It's, it's very complicated. Psyche of people works differently and uh, not all people can flee this territory. And probably, uh, you know, uh, it's good that people are there and that they are defending, you know, and we, all other people need to help those people to defend our territory. This is what we do all the time. So, but uh, there are different evacuation uh, groups. There are different uh, groups who deliver humanitarian aid. So it's uh, with the, the like domestic volunteers and international efforts. So that's it. Thank you. I mean, we're almost, yeah, we're almost at 12.15. So um, is there anything else that you want to say just in the remaining, whatever, 30 seconds? Uh, okay, 30 seconds. Thank you so much again for inviting me and for talking about Ukraine. Thank you for I would being be here. happy to answer any type of questions you will you will be having. Unfortunately, the only thing, and it scares me too, that we don't have any any other option right now than to fight. And we are grateful to all our international partners who make this fight possible. Because without you, every everyone, we are not we are not capable, unfortunately, to defeat. 
the Russian army. But with the support of our allies, partners, we are capable to do it and we are doing it. And hopefully there will be a moment when I will be uh, somewhere in Crimea and um, I invite all of you to come over there and uh, see this wonderful peninsula. It's truly beautiful. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here and taking the time. I appreciate our audience and asking all the questions. Sorry if we cannot get to all of them, but uh, I uh, just hope, yeah, well, let's let's keep up the hope, right, for the peaceful resolution, eventual peaceful resolution of all the conflicts that are going on right now. And I um, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Irina, so very much. Thank you very much for your comments and uh, for the discussion, interesting discussion, I should say. Uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Um, Thank you, take yeah. care and all the best. And of course, also Thank to my you. colleague, Professor Kostadinova and Christine. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much for wonderful questions.